Uh, next, we have John Meeker, our associate chair, uh, an exposure scientist who's also morphed into a biomarker epidemiologist, doing his cutting edge work. This uh, title, I will say, um, he was too shy to invent it himself, uh, but we invented it for him. Uh, endocrine disruptors, sexy stuff. Yes, thank you to the communications office for that. And uh, I did receive some good advice just now. Uh, just go out and dazzle them, so no pressure. And uh, so with that, I guess I'll get started. So there are anywhere from 80 to 100,000 chemicals in use in the United States today, uh, depending on where you look. And uh, uh, among those, there's a, a number, somewhere around 3,000, according to the EPA, that are considered high production volume chemicals. These are chemicals that are produced or imported into the U.S. at, at volumes of greater than or equal to 1,000 or 1 million pounds per year. Um, among these, there's one that I'm sure you've all heard of that, that Dr. Dolanoy just, just spoke about, which is BPA. Uh, BPA obviously has been controversial. A lot of countries have been phasing it out for certain uses as well as several states in the U.S. And uh, last year it came up for a vote in the state of Maine, uh, and where the governor was quoted as saying, if you take a plastic bottle and put it in the microwave, uh, and then you heat it up, it gives off a chemical similar to estrogen. So the worst case is some women may have little beards. And this was his way of, of justifying uh, his stance against it. So no matter where you fall on this, uh, your opinion for the, the spectrum of toxicity of BPA, I think we could all agree here that we would hope our decision makers have a little more respect for the science and, and try to make more evidence-based de decisions in the process. Um, so he mentioned estrogen, so he, he did get that part right. BPA is estrogenic, but uh, the more we study endocrine disruptors, the more complex we're realizing um, this, this endocrine hypothesis to be. So we have uh, impacts can happen at various levels of the, of the endocrine axes. It could be the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thyroid, the adrenal gland, the, the gonads. It, it um, can also impact other organs in the body. And we're also learning that it's not just the receptors that, that, that might be the point of action. It could be uh, something impacting the synthesis, the secretion, the, the transport, binding, or metabolism of, of the hormones, which may throw off that balance. And because it's a system, it's like other systems. If you take away one or more pieces of that system, it can have some, some pretty drastic and maybe unpredictable consequences down the line. <clears throat> so. I'm going to go into a little bit of history. So endocrine disruptors, as it turns out, have been around all along. We have naturally occurring endocrine disruptors in uh, things like genistein and other isoflavones, um, a lot of metals. Uh, some current research is showing uh, several metals also act as endocrine disruptors. Um, but to take you through a little bit of history, um, the book Silent Spring in the 19, early 1960s by Rachel Carson was a New York Times bestseller. It really put on the radar the environmental movement and uh, because the focus of the book uh, much was uh, DDT and other organochlorines as it related to persistence and wildlife effects, um, it is credited with, with sort of moving the discussion and, and uh, generating more uh, careful consideration for pesticide regulation in this country. Um, during that same time, uh, from about the 1940s to 1970, uh, several, or another estrogenic, synthetic estrogen, sort of like BPA, was being prescribed for women with recurrent miscarriage in order to prevent those or other adverse pregnancy outcomes. However, um, in the early 1970s, it was found that these are leading to reproductive tract disorders in, in, the, in the offspring. So um, these offspring then became known as DES daughters and DES sons, and uh, have become a, this has become a model, a human model, unfortunately, for uh, what endocrine disruption for a certain type of endocrine disruptor, what it might do in the human body. Um, and there's research coming out now, actually on the third generation, also showing reproductive tract issues, uh, which is thought to be due to epigenetic changes, as Dr. Dolanoy talked about. Uh, moving ahead to the 1990s, um, the book on the left was uh, called Our Stolen Future, also um, widely read by the, the general public. Um, by Theo Colborn and, and colleagues, with forward by Al Gore. But um, this one took 
all the existing science to date, there were you know, some studies on endocrine disruption, but not really, hadn't really gained much steam yet. And they put those together and then really broadened these, the scope. And they hypothesized that it's not only a, a range of reproductive problems that, that we're looking at. This could have far-reaching effects, things like obesity, uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, um, neuro, neurodevelopment effects, neurodegeneration, uh, so a range of cancers. So it really um, put it out there and really got the discussion going. A few years later, in 1999, the National Academies uh, put together a committee that came out with this book on hormonally active agents. And uh, it concluded, um, put together all the studies, said there are some, some, some evidence there. It's inconsistent, but, but this could be real. Uh, more research is needed. Um, and since then, there's been quite a bit of research, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of studies going on. And now I'm just going to touch on a couple of the more uh, controversial ones that I think are good examples of how uh, some of these results can, re can lead to uh, just a firestorm of media action, some public outcry, and heavy debate with uh, the people who manufacture these chemicals. Uh, the first example is um, one of uh, frogs. This is the work of Tyrone Hayes out at uh, uh, Berkeley who in the early part of this century uh, put out a series of papers showing that the pesticide atrazine was um, leading to uh, demac demasculiz demasculinization and hermaphroditism uh, among frogs. So they, they dosed these frogs with the, the atrazine at low doses, um, and they were finding that they were growing both, uh, forming both male and female reproductive organs. Now atrazine is a uh, a heavily used herbicide, primarily on corn. And as a proud Iowa native, of course, I have to show a picture of Field of Dreams. Uh, <laughs> is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. Though, Shoeless Joe and his buddies might want to find another place to hang out. I don't know. <laughs> Although, if I remember correctly, they're ghosts. I don't know if ghosts have endocrine systems. So I don't know what to think there. Uh, the next example is uh, another chemical many of you are probably aware of. This is phthalates in the late 90s. Uh, several different uh, groups were reporting male reproductive tract anomalies in rodents dosed with very high levels of, of certain phthalates. And, uh, you know, that's hard to interpret because they were such high doses. However, uh, several years later, um, an epidemiology study by Shauna Swan and her colleagues uh, did, sh did see that levels of phthalate exposure during pregnancy at levels found among the general population were associated with um, some markers of anti-androgenic activity and, and smaller genitalia, things like that. So obviously that led to a lot of, a lot of media, a lot of public, and a lot of uh, corporate reaction that is actually still going on. And uh, a lot more studies are needed to really uh, replicate this work. So that brings us to present day. Um, with the current regulatory system, I mentioned there's tens if not hundreds of thousands of chemicals out there, and uh, only a very small fraction of these have been thoroughly tested for toxicity based on a risk assessment framework. So, and then when you further go along that line, some of these tests are considered outdated and may not be sensitive to changes in function that might be important to this, to this system. And beyond that, studies in humans are extremely limited still. So uh, when you think about all the chemicals out there, how things are done, um, there's a lot of agreement growing now that, that, that things should change. So this is just a, a letter to, in, the, in Science last year um, showing that several societies, the American Medical Association, the Endocrine Society, uh, several others, signed this letter. Uh, it represents 40,000 scientists and clinicians saying, Hey, government and other decision makers, please call upon our expertise to help you uh, figure out how to deal with these things. So the future. This is a very basic figure that uh, hopefully my students remember from class, something like this. But we have the basic risk assessment process. You have hazard identification, dose response, exposure assessment, uh, risk characterization, and then ultimately risk management. So moving forward, I'm going to talk about some things that we really need to improve upon if we want to get a grasp of this, this situation. And a lot of these re revolve around exposure, one of, my, one of my interests. So one is life stage. We know that uh, developmental exposures are likely the most susceptible to this type of exposure. But how do we measure it? What time frames? 
Is it early pregnancy, late pregnancy, childhood, previous generations? What about uh, adulthood? We can't ignore that. If we look at it, uh, diseases in adulthood, like cancers, how are we gonna estimate exposure early on? And this comes around to the, the whole exposome uh, idea, which Dr. Zellers will talk about later. And uh, you know things like, how are we gonna measure exposure the most effectively for risk assessment and for epidemiology? How do we do that? We're gonna need new markers. We have a lot of good biomarkers, but they're cost prohibitive when you think about how many chemicals are out there. You can't measure everything. When I say exposure assessment, this is what a lot of people probably think of. These point sources that are uh, easily visible. Um, it's kind of somebody else's fault kind of, uh, kind of situation. You have a smokestack, you have this green goo coming out of a pipe, you have a, an airplane spraying pesticides everywhere. That's what people think of. However, when we talk about endocrine disruptors, through some of my work, this is what I start to think of. You know, going into the, to the store, you have just rows and rows and warehouses full of, of products that we go in, we willingly buy, we take into our home. They contain uh, all kinds of chemicals that were used in the manufacture. Some are left there on site which may be a worker exposure issue, but then some are uh, either bound in the product or are added to the product and can leach out. Things like flare retardants and phthalates can leach out. So you can see, uh, just in this picture alone, you can identify a lot of plastic. So plastics actually make up a, a good portion of chemical, the chemicals that are produced. And the uh, most recent estimate I've seen, it accounts for 8% of global oil production. Um, you can see it's, it's exponentially increasing in the last few decades. So what this means is we have more and more plastics. They're very useful for many things. Um, they are beneficial in a lot of ways, but we need to think a little bit more about what, what are the consequences. How are we exposed? We're likely exposed in a lot of different ways. And moving forward, when things get uh, start to become banned or the usage changes and we start disposing of these things, um, according to EPA last year, about 12% of the 250 million uh, tons of, of waste put into landfills was made up by plastics. So thinking of this, in the future, maybe the sources of exposure are gonna, are gonna change. Maybe it's gonna be more of these point sources, these waste things. Maybe it's gonna be in the diet, kind of like the situation with PCBs and other organic chlorine pesticides that we're seeing now. So history may be repeating itself. Dose response. A, a paper just last week came out talking about uh, what, what it means, uh, dose response means in the endocrine disruption setting. And they reviewed more than 800 papers. This is a, a new paper by Vandenberg et al. They, uh, that point to or support their, their uh, stance that non-linear and non-monotonic dose responses are occurring uh, with the use of some uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So here's something representing sort of the classic view of, of dose response, maybe uh, you know, linear or at least monotonic where you, you know, that slope might change but it's always gonna go in the same direction. However, if we were to take a step back, we might see something like this. This is where this, uh, this idea is, is going, where if you are testing something in animals at a high dose, say where it comes back down again, that might not be able to uh, be adequate for predicting something that might be happening at a, at a low dose. So that's the, the thinking there. I love Chex Mix. I love Trail Mix. They're both in the same aisle at the grocery store of salty <laughs> snacks. Uh, but they, they do different things. The Chex Mix, it's got all these little different bits, but they're all doused in the same salty mix of either traditional teriyaki, <laughs> maybe barbecue. They're coming up with new ones all the time. But, you know, they look different. They, they have a different crunch, crisp, but you get that additive response of flavor of the saltiness. Whereas trail mix I like because you eat some of the salty, but then you go to the sweet, you bite into an M&M and it really enhances that flavor. So, <laughs> and vice versa. So this is sort of analogous, I think, and other mechanisms to what can be going on with chemical mixtures. So I talked about the number of chemicals out there. This recent study showed among pregnant women in NHANES that dozens of potential or known endocrine disruptors are measurable in, in pregnant women, and that's only what they tried to measure. Who knows what's out there that they didn't even try to test. So how do we, how do we account for this? How do we test for this? It's gonna take new, new uh, approaches. The way we're doing it now is not gonna be able to get at this. Um, and then finally, to risk management. Um, so say we, we do find these to be, to be harmful. What do we do then? 
um, an, uh, another study that came out just last week in environmental health perspectives um, shows that they measured about 50 different endocrine disruptors and, and a few other chemicals in a range of personal and consumer care or consumer and personal care products, and they showed that a lot of they showed a lot of these hits of uh, of these chemicals in these products they just grabbed off the shelves, and these dark red circles, those indicate that for certain phthalates and other chemicals, more than 10% by weight of the product was, was that chemical. So there are some wide-ranging, multiple chemicals in these products, many at high concentrations. Uh, they also tested some alternative products, uh, advertised as natural, and still got some hits. So where does that leave us for, for risk management? We can't, as consumers, really, um, how do we go about our day? I can't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to avoid endocrine disruptors today. That's not going to be possible. It, so it's something else is going to have to have to happen. So what do we do? Do we just ignore it? Do we despair? Do we go off the grid? <laughs> do we go overboard and and uh, go overprotect ourselves? We don't we don't know what to do. So the best I can say is, we need more information. We really want to know: Are these are, which chemicals are harmful? How harmful? What are they doing? And how best can we reduce exposure? Um, and to do that, I think it's going to require some of the things that we've been talking about and will be themes throughout the day. This is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research. Um, and that's why the University of Michigan is a great place to, for this to happen. We have leading toxicologists, epidemiologists, exposure scientists. We have other disciplines around campus in medicine and, and, and engineering, other places that uh, we really need to work together to, to try to address some of these things. And we already have started. We have several examples. One is a formative children's center um, led by Karen Peterson, who'll be up next. Um, we also have the NIEHS core center that uh, also studies endocrine disruptors. Uh, the example I'm going to touch on briefly is this study in Puerto Rico we're doing. Um, Puerto Rico has the highest rate of, of preterm births in the US of all US jurisdictions. They also have a very large number of of hazardous waste sites with endocrine disrupting compounds. So we have a multidisciplinary team of, of all the disciplines I talked about, physicians, engineers, looking at exposure, looking at uh, predictors of preterm birth, whether these are connected. And there's a lot of, of collaboration going on, and we're seeing a lot of things coming out of this that transcend any single discipline and gives us that transdisciplinary approach that I think is going to be needed to solve some of these uh, very large public, or public health and environmental health issues in the future. Thank you.